get into it, because today we're answering a viewer question, because Jen M asks us, what did they do with all the dead bodies after huge battles in history? Given we know that even Neanderthals would bury their dead, even including objects with the bodies, and various human hunter-gatherer groups likewise used to bury or cremate people at specific sites that functioned as sort of pilgrimage locations for these nomads, it should come as no surprise that since the dawn of known warfare, soldiers have pondered the question of what to do with the bodies of their fallen comrades and enemies. So what did various groups throughout history actually do about this? A thing we should note before we continue is that there is a definite gap in the memory of history in regards to this one specific matter, and historians only have sparse reports of what happened to the dead of many groups after battles. You might think that solving this problem would simply be a matter of locating famous battle sites and doing some digging to glean a little more insight, but it turns out even this is notoriously difficult, as we're going to get into shortly. That caveat out of the way, on the more definitive front, it's noted that the ancient Greeks made an effort to respect the usual burial customs of the dead after a battle, and collecting the bodies of the fallen was not uncommon. For example, following the Battle of Chaeronea in 338 BC between Philip II of Macedonia and the Athenians, both sides buried their dead in accordance with the religious customs of the period. This was essentially done both out of respect for the valor of the dead as well as to appease the gods. With the exception of the Spartans, most ancient Greek societies also made efforts to bury their dead near the city that they hailed from, if time allowed for it. For the sake of practicality, though, mass graves or the like were sometimes utilized instead. In this case, cenotaphs were sometimes erected near their home city in honor of the fallen. As noted, an exception to this are the Spartans, who often buried fallen soldiers on the battlefield where they were killed. Also somewhat unique was that rather than stripping the dead of valuables, as per Spartan tradition, each fallen Spartan was buried with their weapons and armor, and their final resting place was marked by a simple tombstone with their name and an inscription that read, translated, in war. This was actually a special honor among the Spartans. If one were to die outside of a battle, no such tombstone would be given and the person would simply be buried in an unmarked grave. The one exception to that was if a woman died in childbirth, then she too would be given the honor of a tombstone. As for the Romans, most soldiers paid a small stipend each month to pay for funeral expenses should they fall in battle. As you might expect from this, the Romans made a conscious effort to recover the bodies of those who died, and if time allowed it, they would bury or cremate them individually. If this wasn't possible, the bodies of soldiers killed in battle would be collected and given a mass cremation or burial. In the event that the bodies couldn't be recovered, a cenotaph would be erected to serve as a monument to the individual. The same cannot be said of later wars, where there seems to have been an almost callous disregard for the fallen and looting of the dead and dying was commonplace. For example, the Bear Tapestry, depicting the Battle of Hastings in 1066, shows soldiers piling up bodies of the dead and stripping them of their valuables. It is believed that following this, bodies were quickly cremated or buried in nearby mass graves. It should be noted here, however, that with the rise of Christianity, mass cremation, at least for a time, seems to have gone the way of the dodo in some regions in favor of mass graves. That said, despite the countless battles that occurred throughout medieval Europe, archaeologists have had an extraordinarily difficult time actually finding any of the bodies. As one paper published in the Journal of Conflict Archaeology, aptly titled Where are the Dead of Medieval Battles, notes, only a handful of mass graves from the late medieval battles in Western Europe have been subject to large-scale excavation to modern standards. The principal reason is that these, and indeed even early modern battlefield graves, have proven extremely elusive, most being identified by chance. Despite a few successes, no combination of prospecting techniques yet provides a consistently effective method of locating such small archaeological features set almost anywhere within a site covering many square kilometers. Looking at much better documented times, looting of the dead was also extraordinarily common during the extremely deadly Napoleonic Wars, with soldiers and locals alike pilfering what they could find after battles. For example, consider this account from a British general following the Battle of Heilsberg in 1807. The grounds between the woods and the Russian batteries, about a quarter of a mile, was a sheet of naked human bodies, which friends and foes had, during the night, mutually stripped, although numbers of these bodies still retained consciousness of their situation. It was a sight that the eye loathed, but from which it could not remove. And yes, as noted there, the severely wounded weren't spared the indignity of being robbed of their worldly possessions as they lay dying. And worst of all, this was done not just by their enemies, but by their comrades as well. In fact, there are first-hand accounts from wounded soldiers who went on to survive their injuries, detailing the shock of waking up completely naked. Here's a snippet of one such quote from a French soldier called Jean-Baptiste de Marbeau. Stretched on the snow among the piles of dead and dying, unable to move in any way, I gradually, and without pain, lost 
consciousness. I judged that my swoon lasted four hours, and when I came to my sense, I found myself in this horrible position. I was completely naked, having nothing on but my hat and my right boot. A man of the transport corps, thinking me dead, had stripped me in the unusual fashion, and wishing to pull off the only boot that remained, was dragging me by one leg with his foot against my body. The jerk which the man gave me no doubt had restored me to my senses. I succeeded in sitting up and spitting out the clots of blood from my throat. The shock caused by the wind of the ball had produced such an extravasation of blood that my face, shoulders, and chest were black, while the rest of my body was stained red by the blood from my wounds. My hat and my hair were full of blood-stained snow, and as I rolled my haggard eyes, I must have been horrible to see. Anyhow, the transport man looked the other way and went off with my property without my being able to say a single word to him. So utterly prostrate was I. After being stripped of their belongings, the dead, and occasionally still barely living, would often be buried in mass graves, sometimes with bodies from both sides unceremoniously being thrown in. In general, this was either accomplished via the soldiers themselves doing it, or in many cases, members of the local populace being given the gruesome task. However, there are accounts of battles where thousands of bodies were simply left to the elements. For example, General Philippe Segur states in 1812, after passing the Kaloga, we marched on, absorbed in thought, when some of us, raising our eyes, uttered a cry of horror. Each one instantly looked about him, and there lay stretched before us a plain trampled, bare and devastated, all the trees cut down within a few feet of the surface, and farther off craggy hills, the highest of which appeared misshapen and bore a striking resemblance to an extinguished volcano. The ground around us was everywhere covered with fragments of helmets and cuirasses, with broken drums, gunstocks, tatters of uniforms, and standards dyed with blood. On that desolate spot lay thirty thousand half-devoured corpses. It should also be noted here that beyond any possessions the bodies may have had on them before being stripped, the bodies themselves were also of value. For example, human scavengers would come through and rob the dead of their teeth, which would then be used to make dentures. The Napoleonic Wars and the Battle of Waterloo in particular were such a boon for the British dental industry in this way that dentures for a time were known as Waterloo teeth in the UK. Teeth from soldiers were highly sought after, owing to predominantly coming from relatively young men who still had reasonably good teeth. In one account, one Astley Cooper met such a tooth hunter and noted, Upon asking this butler, who appeared to be in a state of great destitution, what might be his object, he said it was to get teeth. But when I came to question him upon the means by which he was to obtain these teeth, he said, Oh, sir, only let there be a battle, and there'll be no want of teeth. I'll draw them as fast as the men are knocked down. Even more grimly, the bones of the dead of some of these battles were later collected and pulverized into fertilizer, which was sold for a modest price across Europe. To quote an article from The Observer written in 1822, It is now ascertained beyond a doubt by actual experiment on an extensive scale that a dead soldier is a most valuable article of commerce, and for aught be known to the contrary, the good farmers of Yorkshire are, in a great measure, indebted to the bones of their children for their daily bread. It is certainly a singular fact that Great Britain should have sent out such multitudes of soldiers to fight the battles of this country upon the continent of Europe, and should then import their bones as an article of commerce to fatten her soil. The remains of soldiers were also sometimes collected for use in souvenirs of major battles. For example, poet Eton Stannard Barrett wrote, I know one honest gentleman who brought home a real Waterloo thumb, nail and all, which he preserves in a bottle of gin. Moving across the ponds and to slightly more recent history, markedly more respect was shown for the dead during the American Civil War, where teams of soldiers were tasked with burying the dead of both sides in simple mass graves, with great care being taken to ensure most soldiers received a proper burial. Finally, to discuss World War I and World War II, individual units were largely responsible for the disposal of their own dead, with both Axis and Allied forces having their own rules for how this should be handled. For example, during World War II, Colonel Volfer Sontag of the Wehrmacht's Casualty Office issued a comprehensive guide for how military mass graves should be constructed. Amongst other things, the guidelines indicated that mass graves should be made as close to railway lines as possible and to feature pathways, with the intention being that they'd eventually be turned into war cemeteries. As the war raged on, these guidelines were largely ignored for the sake of practicality. 
As for the Allies during World War II, burying the dead largely fell to individual soldiers, but some units dedicated to the task did exist. For example, the United States' Quartermaster Graves Registration Service. Tasked with finding and burying every fallen American soldier, the Quartermaster Graves Registration Service have been hailed as some of the unsung heroes of the war due to the general lack of recognition they've received since it ended. Graves Registration Units were exceptionally committed to their task and undertook their duties with a solemn sense of duty and determination, going to extraordinary lengths to identify bodies and perform the appropriate burial rites depending on the fallen soldier's religious affiliation. When appropriate, GRS units would bury civilian, allied, and Axis casualties they came across, making sure to bury them in well-marked graves. The location of these graves was then passed on to the relevant authorities.